Okay. Good afternoon, more or less. Um, so today we are starting, we will start to speak about prototyping. That's, that will be one activity that you will do again and again and again during the, the rest of the course. Uh, but before speaking about prototyping, let's do uh, a different version of the same game that we do every week. So the all of fame or shame thing, but not for user interface, but for user needs. Um, because at least in my, my lab slot, uh, I've seen still some confusion about what, are, what is a need and what is not. So we can try to play this game uh, with these fake needs that I put here that now will, will appear, actually. Um, some of these are from some groups that are in my slot by memory. So if you recognize one of yours, be honored. Uh, not ashamed to be here. Um, so the, the game is always the same. Now we'll show you one sentence at a time and you're going to tell me if it's actually a good need to put in the Hall of Fame or a bad need or not a need at all. And so we're going to put it in the Hall of Shame. And hopefully this will help you to write the needs for the assignment too. Uh, because if you create good needs, you can generate five solutions or more for each need. If your needs are not so good, it will be more difficult to generate that number of solution for each need. Okay, so uh, the, here there is the same text that we have from the assignment, just as a reminder, nothing new, from the assignment one. And also a warning that say that for all these needs, clearly we are missing the general context. We don't know where these needs were created. We don't know how they stem from some domain, some topic, some interviews. They're just sentences. And reading them, we can say, okay, this is more a need, or so all of fame, or, or more not a need, so all of shame. Okay? Are you ready? No? But anyway, you will be. So this is easy, easy one. Is, is a need or not? It's written like a need, user needs. All of them will be start with user needs something. But this is a need? No. 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 Who say yes? Okay. Nobody to, to say to leave the, the class. Good. This is not a need. Because it's not a need? Why is it not a need? Yes, because it's a solution. But why it's a solution? How do you recognize from the syntax, the semantic of the sentence in English, that this is a solution and not a need? No verb, it's a noun, it's an object. It's a horse, right? It's a concrete object. Hmm? So this, is, this, is, this was easy because we already discussed this, but this actually could be also a solution for a domain, we don't know which is the domain, but we, if we imagine the domain like a, a court and horse competition. Hmm? So horse running, and you have to win with an horse, also this could be a solution for winning a competition because you need a faster horse to win a competition of horses. And so not only for the car domain, also for that. So accordingly to the context be behind it, we can say, we can sh surely say that this is a solution, so it's in the whole of shame, and we can try, but we, we need to know the, the context, we can try to extract a need from this solution. Because if you know the context and you write a solution, you know the story, you know the problem. And remember the needs are always midway between the problem and the solution, but more close to the problem. So if you start from the problem, you are easy to, it's easy for you 
to generate a need and not starting from the solution. Okay, another one. Users need to have financial help. Here we have a verb, have. Is it a need or not? And why yes or why not? Sorry? It should be. How many say it should be? Or oh, yes? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six. And how many of you say that this is not a need? Why is not a need? Okay, this is okay. Um, yes, it's a bit too general. It, it is, it can be a need. Clearly, can, a different from the other one is probably more a need than a solution. Yes, exactly. It can be a need. But it's not enough. You need the financial help to do what? First of all, to, to do what? You need the financial help. So it's, it's too general. And then, yes, it's closer to a solution than a problem, actually. Because what is the problem here? We don't know, clearly. But we, we need money, essentially, to solve some problem. But probably that same problem could be solved also having stuff for free. So not money, but the stuff that you need for free. So that is, again, similar to solution. It has a need. It's, it's closer to a need than the other one. The other one was clearly not a need. This is something closer to, to it. So it's unspecific, should be more specific, to have financial help to do what? And it's missing, so it's not close enough to the problem. Why you need financial help? To buy stuff, okay, and why you need to buy stuff? Because we don't have enough, okay, why you don't have enough now? Because we cannot practice, okay, so the need is more practice, not more stuff. More stuff is a solution for that specific need. Okay, and also if you think about solution you can generate, how many solutions you can generate from having financial help? Oh, give money. That is the one solution. And the others, you probably finish with the solution. If the need behind this is user need to practice more with the proper tools, for instance, financial help is a solution. Tools for free is another solution. Different kind of tools could be another solution. It depends which tool, clearly. And so it's easier to generate more solution. Good. There are six overall, so we are halfway. User needs, without the S, user need a way to move faster from one place to another. Some of these six are actually needs, so. This could be a need. How, how many of you think that this could be a need? Okay, the vast majority. Who think that this is not a need? Okay, so yes, this actually is a need. It can be probably described depending on the context, maybe it's slightly better in some part, but it's depend on the context. Like, what means move faster? But, but clearly it can be, can be a need. And again, if we imagine transportation domain, or better, uh, let's imagine um, that you have to ship pa uh, packages around the city. So a solution for these needs is faster cars. Another solution for these needs can be uh, more sophisticated routes between the steps you have to do, so that to avoid traffic, etc., cetera. It's, it's move faster. You're still the same speed, you're moving from the same speed, but you optimize the route from reaching one point or another. Or another solution could be providing a map that cluster close destinations together and so suggests you to move, first of all, in the destinations that are closer to each, each other, et cetera. 
that is different from optimizing the routes to avoid traffic, but still on the map. So all of these could be solution from these if we imagine that you have to ship packages around the city. Next one. Is it more a need or less a need? It's more a solution, more a need, what is? In the middle? Say again. Yes, and? So? It's not a well-written need. Yes, also in this case. Tools for the what? It's similar, it's similar to financial help. It's, it's more a need than financial help. It can be a need. This can be a need, it can be a valid need. In some contexts, it can be perfect as a need, it depends on the context. But in, even in this case, it's still a little bit more general. More tools as a number of tools. So this could be the need behind the financial help. A step behind the financial help. I need financial help because I need more tools. But why need more tools? So move closer to the problem, and again, practice more could be uh, the need. So this is better than the others, probably starting to, to look at proper need. Good. Two more. I mentioned this already, so you should know that. It is, is not a need, big one. It's a solution. Why it's a solution? That is? I don't totally agree. Uh, anybody else that agree or not? How many of you think that this is a need? Okay, how many of you think this is not a need? Well, clearly. Why is it not a need? What is the process? Well, clearly, this, this again depends on the context. But if you are, uh, if your domain, if your context is a practice activity in which you have to learn by practicing, then it's, it's immediate that this is not, this is what they do now. So it, it can be a need in that, pro, in that sense. Uh, clearly, if you're thinking about other domain, so that is the beware at the beginning. If you're thinking other domain, that could be something that you, you want to enforce, like, oh, you have to practice more. You don't practice at all, and you have to practice more. That could be what, what you're saying. But if you already are in a domain of practicing, then practice more can make sense. Uh, no, always, don't forget here, we're missing the general context. But if we are in a practicing domain, so this is actually one need that emerged in, in my slot. But here, there we, we were in the practicing, in a practice, in a practicing, in a practice, in a training, environment, so that was by default uh, that including the process, because it was already the processing place, so it's not a new process we are suggesting, and it's not really, a, for the same reason, it's not really a solution. It can be a little bit more specific, yes, the appropriate tool, uh, but again, depends on the context. If you are in a training process in which you know the tools, remember task analysis, no? You, you know the tools uh, because you interview people, you have seen these tools. So if you are in a training solution with tools that you know, which are, hmm? so here, we, instead of we are with tools, we can write a, a better word, maybe to specify better which kind of tools, that could be absolutely a valid need hmm? if you are in a training situation. And this is something that emerged from the interviews, from the observation, et cetera. If again, if instead it's something that you want to enforce on people, so you are not in a training solution, not in a practice solution, that risk to be not a well done need. But as it's formulated, 
it can be clearly on it. Hmm? Context dependent. Last one. Is it a need? No. Who say that is who agree that is not a need? Not convinced. Not a lot of people. Who say that this is a need? And the others? Like the vast majority? Okay, why is a need? Or is not? I don't remember. Okay. Anybody else? Sorry, I don't know who is speaking. Yeah. Maybe if you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you run. <coughs> yes? Yeah, we don't know because we, don't, we are missing the context here, but. So yes, this, oh yes, please. You think that the syntax is agree in agreement with the content. Uh, I, this is actually a tricky one, and more than the others. Uh, because yeah, it's, it's, I agree that it's closer to a solution than to an actual problem. Uh, but it, again, also in this case, it's really, really dependent on the context. Um, so if we are thinking about people that uh, run, professional athlete, uh, that is actually probably more uh, solution uh, because yes they clearly need to run faster to, to win something uh, for instance but what's the problem why they need to run faster what they need they don't need just to run faster they need probably more training a different kind of training specific training personalized training so this is probably more tricky I want to run faster to win the competition. Probably more than need to run faster. I, I need to want to win the competition, in a sense. And then to win the competition, I think that I should run faster. Maybe it's not a matter of running faster. Maybe it's a matter of uh, a different pace, hmm? a more constant pace, instead of running faster at the beginning and then die at the end. Or, uh, a different kind of tri training or other things. So yeah, that is more tricky to, if we think about athletes, it's more tricky to extract a need from this because we have clear that is the goal is winning the competition. So train better to win the competition. The need is probably a little bit more difficult to write down because all of these train more, we are changing the process. Run faster is actually maybe not just running faster, it's maybe a different uh, performance related. So, this is more probably tricky to write it down as a single sentence that is not very, very long. So this is a tricky, that it depends, on, again, on the context. It could be, uh, you can convince a person that this is a need, or you can convince a person that this is a solution. Uh, if you have good reasons, that is more tricky. I put it here just because it's actually more tricky to, 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 to understand. Again, it's totally dependent on the context. In the running context, it could make sense. In other contexts, it could just be a solution because it's, it is, because uh, but again, in this case, what I would ask myself if I brought this need is, 
always do one step behind. So which is the problem here? Why I want to run faster? Because I want to win the competition. Why I cannot win the competition now? Because exactly, because I don't have enough breath or strength, that's it. So moving back in these quest chains of questions will probably allow you to write a, a better, a more clear need than not just one. So user needs to be able to perform in a better way, including speed, breath, resistance, strength, etc., etc. for example. So in most cases, uh, what I've seen, in, at least in my slot, but maybe also in the other lab slot, is that you know the answers, but uh, you tend to write, at least mine, the, the one in my slot, tend to write things more close to the, to the solution, and after one, two, three questions, you are, you know because you did the interviews, you, you did everything, so you know the proper answer, you know the motivations, but you need to, to do a step or two steps behind asking why. Why this is here? Why this is a need now? So think about one easier, the financial help. So why I need financial help? To buy, to buy my stuff, to, to buy more stuff. Why I need to buy more stuff? Because in the practice session, we have to share material and we cannot because there is not enough. And, and why there is not, why the fact that you, you share is a problem? Because maybe in some context, it's not a problem if you share material. Uh, so it's a problem because we don't practice enough. And so that is the need, the practicing more because we don't practice enough. And so practice enough will give you, not practice enough will give you many solutions. Hmm? including by stuff, including the find new way to, to enable the visualization of what they need to practice more, if it's, that is the, the need that emerge from the interviews. Hmm? So if you try to move towards the problem that they currently have, and it's probably easier to generate a need. Okay? I hope that this is helping and not adding confusion, but that was the goal at least. Any questions before we proceed? No. Okay, so prototyping. So where we are, more or less in the sort of process we are following. Well, we started as, for instance, your lab from the domain, understanding the context because you, you went to interview some people, getting some people from the interviews, reflecting on the stream user, the domain expert, and the immediate user that are the, the target users, excluding the other one. Then we did some need finding, you did some need finding, uh, mostly interviews, but we also covered the other things in class. And now, hmm, here in the lecture, and then from assignment three onwards, we will move, well, partly also in assignment two, but more in assignment three, we will more, move more, let me do it again. We will move more towards the ideation of the interactive system. So we found a problem, hopefully we found some needs, we found some solutions that help to solve those needs. And at a certain point, we need to, to design a user interface, an interactive system. It's not saying, oh, a solution is give more money to these people. Uh, that is a solution. It's not a solution that we can probably implement as a user interface, but it's still a solution. So we need to move from the solution to the actual uh, interactive system. And in the analysis slash ideation phase, that is how to satisfy the need, how to implement, in a way, the solution, uh, we already have seen something like the storyboards, the task analysis that are more in the analysis part, but also can help for the ideation to contextualize better, to bring some pieces of this context along the rest of the process. And we are going to cover today and tomorrow various kind of prototypes, including the paper prototypes that will be actually assignment three for you. And then we will evaluate them and then 
we will cycle basically here between prototypes and evaluation for the semester. So this is more or less the process. So which is the goal of prototyping? Uh, the first goal of prototyping is clearly make ideas, make solution or the selected solution visible. And this visible can mean generate new ideas, more targeted, including a user interface, including virtual reality, including artificial intelligence, including voice commands, including other things. Uh, also evaluating ideas, a storyboard, allow people in the room to discuss about the context, the solution, the process that you're going to introduce or change or redesign. And also with some kind of prototypes, well, with all kinds of prototypes, it could also be a way to test, to evaluate these ideas. Without building, and this is something that we have said since the beginning, without building the final version of the product, without dedicating weeks and weeks and weeks to build something, but hopefully dedicating hours to build something. So you can generate new ideas quicker, in a quicker way. You can evaluate those ideas with shorter time lapse. And also you can evaluate these ideas after hours or days and not after month. Hmm? So all of this is for making the visible and clearly according to the stage of the design that we are, we can have, and also to the audience that we want to target, we can have different tools, different techniques that we can put in place. So when we are in the early stage of the design, storyboards, can help to convey the idea, to generate an idea, to evaluate an idea. When we are at the end of six months of work, we are more in the final phase, and so we are using different techniques than not storyboard because we have in mind all the process, how our target users, the problems, what also in a graphical user interface or in a user interface is working and what is not working because we iterate it a few times already so we can move more confidently on some things and less on other things. And also, the audience. If you are creating a prototypes that is evaluated by another group of this class, you can be more like expert. Hmm? Not your target user, clearly, but you are expert, you will learn design guidelines, so you can apply those design guidelines to criticize in a positive way um, not to, for the sake of criticizing the, the idea, the prototype of another person or another group, for instance. Instead, if you are the end user, you will not have the knowledge to criticize according to some design guidelines, but you have a lot of knowledge about the task that this prototype, this instrument will allow you to do and if it's useful or not. So clearly, the stage of the design and also the audience change which techniques, which tools we use to prototype. And the error to avoid in general with prototyping, um, and that's why we dedicated two, two, two lesson, lessons to the analysis and the task, is to focus first on the user interface and later on the task. So, the key point is having in mind which are the tasks that you want your user interface to allow people to do, to do in a very good way. And then after you have clear, okay, I, this is my end point, and these are the things that could, can go wrong. At that point, we can say, okay, and we can put this page in this way, and this button in this way, and choose this, and choose that. And after this page, we'll go, to another page or another screen or another views, at least. Mm -hmm. So focus on the task that you want to accomplish before saying, oh, I can put this button, green button here because it's nice. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is not at all useful for, for the task. It's just, you like it. And maybe it's fine, but clearly it's not 
something that you want to accomplish in terms of usability and usefulness of things. So why also prototyping is important? Because prototypes will allow us to quickly and in a cheap way, in a sense, to explore different design alternatives. And we are forcing you to do that already. When we say pick three user needs and generate five solutions for that, is to force you to explore different design alternatives. And we will ask you to generate more than one single prototype that is your first idea. To generate more, not, not five, I can anticipate that, not five prototypes, but not even one, to explore at least another alternative with your original idea. An alternative that will perform the same task, that will accomplish the same things that you have to accomplish, but just in a different way. And if I think about the last editions of this course, so in the last edition of this course, we ask, for instance, two different um, um, low fidelity prototype and we ask them to choose, because they cannot continue with two in the next stage. They need to, to do something. Uh, some groups actually pick the best of both and create a third prototype as in the next step. Others say prototype two was terrible, let's focus on the first one, and others say the contrary. Prototype one was actually terrible, let's focus on the second one. So they explore alternatives and the result was always a better prototype with respect to the beginning of, your, of their own ideas. Hmm? So that is all the concept of prototype in addition to what I've said is to allow you to explore design alternatives. And design alternatives can be explored in that three ways. Hmm? According to the flow of actions, where I'm starting, which is the first page my application, my system show and where I'm ending, and which are the steps in the process. Uh, so for instance, uh, if you are going to, to design something uh, that allow people to find places in a city, let's imagine that, you can have as first page a map with all these places, or you can have a list of all these places from the less from the closer to you, to the more distant to you, or with another criteria of order. These are clearly two starting point different. The task is the same, find the place that do X. But the starting point was the map, so you have to scroll the map, navigate the map, zoom the map, etc. and the other one is a list. You can search the list. So these are two different, totally different alternatives, totally different things you present to your user in terms of flow of actions. One start from a map and they go in that direction, the other start from a list, and maybe selecting a specific place, you see the place on the map to know the address, etc. But still it's a different flow of action. Which is the best? Who knows? We, we cannot know by default which is the best. We need to try it to think about it, to criticize it, to apply rules, to apply guidelines, to understand which are the pros and the cons of, of the both alternative, if we are speaking about two alternatives. And this is the term of flow of action. Then clearly we can have things more complicated like devices. Are we doing something for a smartphone, for a tablet, for a smartwatch, from glasses, like ER, VR headset? for computer desktop, for all of them together. Clearly, not only the flow of action change, but also the things you can do change. We, we already had, uh, I already mentioned this to you that a mouse, for instance, is way more precise than I think it was you. Uh, a mouse is way more precise in selecting things that your finger, and this is something that it's important in your user interface because if you are designing for a computer, you have that precision. If you are designing for a smartphone, you not only have a, a, 
a smaller screen, you also don't have typically the precision that you have. So every object in the screen is different. The design patterns used are different in a smartphone or in a traditional, let's say, computer. Hmm? So also devices and their roles in the ecosystem as um, um, an impact on your design, but also their role in the ecosystem, in the context you are placed. Hmm? If you are doing, again, an application, smartphone application for students is very, very different if you're doing a smartphone application for a doctor in a, let's say a doctor, in a, um, in a surgery room. The level of things that you, the animation you can, you can put in, in the second one should be, be not, not, not distracting too much because it's there clearly not to look at your smartphone application but probably to, to do surgery. So the role in the system, in the environment, the kind of smartphone, for instance, that you can have is totally different. Hmm? The capability that the person has is totally different in one place to another. Hmm? So all of this clearly has to do with exploration of which are the possible alternatives. Um, and overall, these three items uh, are, are true. So it's always possible to find more than one design for a user interface. It's impossible to get it right the first time, no matter how expert you are. You cannot get it right, totally right the first time. You can do a pretty good job, but not totally, totally right the first time. Somebody will find always something that is not working properly. And you also want to find the best possible solution. So iterating on various prototypes also allow you, and exploring alternatives also allow you to do that. And here are the techniques we are going to see. We already have spoken about storyboard, but we could have easily included storyboard here um, between, let's say, after maps, for instance. So we are going to speak today and tomorrow about these six things. Uh, quickly about sketches and maps, a little bit less quickly about paper prototypes that are one way to do low fidelity prototype with kindergarten level of expertise. So really everybody can do a paper prototype. Um, so it's, it's a powerful tool in that sense. And then video prototypes that just to, to let you know that they exist. And then medium and high fidelity prototype that are the next steps also for, for us here after the, the low fidelity prototype we will move to medium fidelity prototype and then you will move with high fidelity prototype. That is the thing you will deliver at the exam. But with prototypes, we start things, thinking about user interfaces, interaction, what to put where, which task you want to enable, etc. And um, well, this is a sentence about prototyping that we, we liked uh, last year, I think, and we put it here. Um, because it makes a parallel with the way of saying if the picture is worth a thousand word, a prototype is worth a thousand meeting. So most of the time, showing something in the former prototype, it's more effective to stay in a room and discuss about, oh, I think that this should be moved there, I think that this should be the color, etc. And then you wrap up the meeting, you do this change, you go back and say, oh, I think that this, no, the color doesn't, I don't like the color, we should change it again. Instead, if you bring something valuable, concrete in the form of prototype, it will be more easier and effective than meet and meet and meet and meet. Because you speak about alternatives, you speak about design alternatives, you can show how things work. You can always show with all kind of prototype how things work. So before moving actually on prototype, Let's speak quickly about sketches. So you, you know what is a sketch, basically. A sketch is an individual drawing showing something. Again, ends done, ends drawn, like this, the storyboards. And actually sketches are typically, can be, cannot also, but can also be part of a storyboard. So a storyboard can be made of one or more sketches. 
hmm, that are single um, area, the single steps of a storyboard. And, but a sketch can also represent a single user interface, interface screen. That is something that we don't put. We know that we don't put in a storyboard because in the storyboard we are focused on more on the task and not on the user interface. Uh, but it can also be the shape of an object or um, a part of the system, an artifact of part of the system. Hmm? So these things here can easily be part of a storyboard in which the person with the smartphone reach this other object and then in the next sketch, in the next step of the storyboard, something happens. Hmm? So you can still tell the story uh, and this is clearly a, a sketch that show you that the smartphone will have something that detects the proximity with this other thing, and then something will happen. Hmm? Again, you don't see the detail of the interface, nor on the smartphone, nor on, the, uh, on this totem, but you have the idea of what happens. There is also this double arrow here that explains to you that it's closing. Hmm? And here also you see, with more details, a user interface that is touch-based. And you know that it's touch-based because there is an end that is touching it. Hmm? Clearly, it, it's immediate. You don't have to explain, oh, it's touch-based because there is an end. You, you, you see it. Hmm? Everybody see it. Hmm? So how do you interact with this interface that some people have in mind? Well, with touch screen, not with mouse, not with keyboard, with touch screen. Hmm? So a sketch that is also the same power, let's say, of the storyboard, is that you can express what you want to do immediately without a lot of explanation. Uh, clearly, a sketch gives a static view of a possible interaction. You don't know what happens next. You don't have dynamicity like you don't have it in uh, storyboards. Uh, but like storyboards, hmm, so that's why also sketch are used in storyboards some kind of sketches, uh, help to set the context of interaction, help to say that this is touch-based and it's probably on a wall hmm, for how it's drawn. And also here, it say that you have to come close to this other object to, to use it or to make something happen. You don't know what happened next. You don't know what happened before, but you know that in that specific moment, this is the, the way of interaction, so it's the context in which you are located. And clearly, often it's part of a longer representation, so a series of sketch, for instance, in the storyboard format. And this is our other two example of a sketch, of user interfaces in this case. And drawn, this should be a map, Madrid, Spain, so it's a geographical map. And trip management, what you want to do with this interface, manage a trip. And it's the end drawn. Probably it took five minutes to, to draw this once you know what you want to do. And it gives an idea of the interaction. Doesn't set the context in this case because we don't see it in a longer presentation, but still it's a sketch, end drawn sketch. and it's sketch. Maps. Maps are typically navigation maps that describe uh, which is the, the structure, the flow, the high level flow of something, an application, a system, etc. So it's just a representation. It doesn't set the context of interaction. It doesn't tell you how you interact. It just tells you how a person move in the application from one page to the other, from one step to another. It's just for representing the organization of the overall application and any relationship, hierarchical relationship that exists within the application. So it's more related to the uh, information architecture. So how the information are spread out and organized in the application, whatever it is the application, okay? So it, there are typical navigation maps like this one. This is um, a mobile phone menus, old style, so clearly not, not a smartphone, um, in which you have 
a circular navigation, meaning that each menu voice, if you continue to press down or up, you move from one menu voice to, to the other infinitely. You never stop, you never reach the end. You move from internet to network to phone book to messages to call, etc., etc. And if you move down, you move in this direction. If you move up, you move in the other direction. But it describes how the structure, the menu in this case, work. And then if you select the internet, you can see, well, maybe not the internet. If you select phone book, you see options. So in phone books, you have an option to read, one option to add a name, um, one action to voice dialing, statistics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? So a, a phone menu like the one that you can have, a cordless phone like the one you can have at home, for instance. Hmm? So this is more or less the structure of, of that map. That is another map made in a totally different way from the previous one that is a website map that describes the structure, the organization of a website, where you can go from where. So from the index, for instance, you can either go here or here. So from the index, you have two pathways, only two, not three. And one is going into the menus, essentially, that will bring it to the intro page, to the tours page, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you pass through some drop-down or search result, you will reach the search result. You look for something, and you will find the results in that page. And you can, from here, either go again in the pages, as before, clicking on one of the results, or you can stay on the same page. You have 100 results, 10 per page, so you stay in the page. If you click next results, the next set of results, you stay in the page. So that's why there is this loop here. Or if you go down here in the selected till page, you can go in the information page, and again, in this case, you can stay in the information page, you can go back to the results, or you can back, go back to the index, because there will be a link, let's say, on page. You click on the link, and you can go back on the index. And also from here, you can always go back to the index, because you will have probably a nav bar that say on page, and if you click on the on page, you go on the on page. So it just describes, it doesn't, we don't know how long is the intro page what there is in the intro page. If there are images, if there are, we don't know from here, but we know that from the intro page, you can go to the index, you can arrive from it from the index, from the search results, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Hmm? You lay out the navigation of something. Hmm? So these are maps. They could be for menus, for website, for application. You can also build that from applications. Hmm? And you will notice that it's always possible from one page to reach the other, and often to go back to the previous one. Hmm? By, by default, by design, you don't have in any application a page that is not reachable without following any links or anything. It's just there, because otherwise it's useless, that page. If nobody can reach it, why there is the page? And once you are in a page, if you cannot go back, or you can't move away from that page, you are stuck there, you have to, to refresh if it's a browser, close the application if it's a, a, a mobile application or a desktop application. So you need always a way to go a good way. And if you, if you have something simple, you probably can do it by just by thinking, do we have a way to go back from here? And do we have a way to reach this page that I'm creating? But if it's large, then probably a map help you not to lose steps. In, the, in links, either web links or other kind of links in the meantime. And these are maps. So, sketches are clearly useful both for prototypes and for storyboard, some kind of sketches. Uh, maps are useful for understanding the navigation, the structure, the organization, to be sure not to, to miss any pieces and also for communicating. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is something that you can find in a manual of the, of the cordless phone. 
hmm, that show you all the options of the phone. So you know, if you look for the call logs, you know the call logs are under calls and times, and it's coming after messages and before settings. So it's also for communicating to people how to use a thing. And the website map is also something that typically you attach as documentation as a website for the client, for your customer, for your boss, for your manager, for other people to understand. Uh, for instance, if every of the essential information of the essential page are there or not, or you're missing some piece of information. Hmm? So for instance, here there is a forum page, but if you don't have, it was one requirement to have the forum page. From here, the commitment, the, commit, the, the, the client or the, your manager or your professor can notice that this requirement is missing hmm? without even opening the, the application, the website, without even navigating, just having a look at this. Hmm? And also these things are things that are quick to do hmm? because it's typically made on pain, paper and pen. You can do it also on computers, but they are typically quick to do. Hmm? So this is more about sketching or representing information. Uh, so now, prototypes. Prototypes, we can define prototypes in this way. Hmm? We have seen what they are useful for. We can describe them in this way. Are tangible approximation at various level of system behavior and appearance and the goal that is already mentioned to cheaply and quickly evaluate and explore design decision. Hmm? But they are always also your final prototype, and I will stress it other times probably during the course, they are approximation. It's not the final version that you're going to ship in, in the world. It's still a prototype. Hmm? So something will be fake. Something will be missing. Not something important, but something will be missing overall, and it's fine. Uh, so here there are a few definitions of prototype. Uh, a prototype is a concrete but partial representation, approximate representation, or implementation. It depends on the level of prototype. So low fidelity prototype is not really an implementation. Uh, of a system design. Uh, they could be of a graphical user interface, or not. You know what is this? The, the black one? Not the white one? You're probably young. Too young for remember this. This one. What is? Who knows what is? Tell me. Yes. Yeah, in Italy it's Palmare. Palmare. Um, it's, uh, it's called, officially it's called Personal Device Assistant, PDA, um, uh, of the, one of the, the, the best, the most famous uh, producer of this object, uh, that was Palm, mm, and this was one of the, the most popular, that was Palm Pilot. Um, so this is the product. Mm? So, in the 2000, I think, more or less, that those years there, uh, some people, not a lot of people, it's not pervasive as smartphone, but some people, especially the one working in business, add some of this to keep note, to have the agenda, to have the calendar, the so things that we now have on smartphones, that is, a small, a very little part of that on this object. And you also had a pen for which you can write on these objects and there were various producers. Palm was the, um, one of the most famous and most successful producer of these objects. So this is the actual object that was sold. Hmm? So you, you could go in a shop, spend, I don't know, 500 euros, 600 euros, and buy one. Um, and typically they weren't 
uh, color red display, the grayscale display, the first models, then the recent one also color red. Uh, they had a specific operating system, some of them more recently, the, the newer one, uh, for instance, HP had some models uh, with a version of Windows on board, the ver specific version of Windows for that, that now is not existing anymore. Uh, but this is the, the product, right? The, the product you sell. What is this? Yes. What is this? We are speaking about prototype. prototype. So what is this? <laughs> the prototype. Clearly it's not a prototype of the user interface. It doesn't show you the flow of things. This is a, a wood prototype. So before creating this, one of the engineers creating this, pick a piece of wood, an actual piece of wood, and cut it in this format and try the actually various format, various, and bring with him for like one month at work, faking it using the pen that is here. It's not really visible, but there is also a pen here, like this one, a board. And every time he's at a meeting, he was actually writing on this piece of paper for, for nothing, because clearly was, the pen was made of board and this was just a piece of paper. You cannot write it. But bring it with him for one month. To understand which is the right size, which is the right weight of this. It shouldn't be too heavy to bring with you. It shouldn't be too large, too small. It's the right size. And he, he, this person did, there is also a link here with the story, but this person did basically a few iterations of this. So this is one of the final very, very low fidelity prototypes of this. Not for the user interface. There is a user interface here that is also similar to the actual one. Mm -hmm. You see here there were just two buttons, and here you have four, but the space here is still there. It's a little bit bigger than in this representation, and this is a calendar mm -hmm. uh, with small icon because it was intended to use it not with the finger, but with the pen. Mm -hmm. This was the lastest model had a resistive touch screen not a capacitive touch screen, like the one that we have now in smartphones. So harder to press, to, to use it. And so this person bring with, with, with him this piece of wood for one month at work. Clearly this was a Palm engineer. So you go to a meeting, you pick your piece of wood and try and write on it for fake, for one month. So creating this, this is one of the examples of the prototype. This is uh, in a museum, uh, actually in a museum, in the, in the Computer History Museum and Mountain View, they have this, in, together with the, the mouses, the first mouse. Also they have this and other stuff. Um, but this is actually something that people did. And, and why honor to one person started to do that and not this? Why a company should do this and not this? It's cheaper? Yes, absolutely, because it's a piece of wood. So probably some 10, 20. Probably $1 or something like that would, would have cost. And then what? Not only cheap. It's easier to change, absolutely. You, just cut the board in a different format, and do those higher, smaller, and? Uh, easier to use, maybe, well, you, you cannot really use it in this case, because it was, uh, maybe, maybe they had different piece of paper to put it, we, we don't know, uh, I don't remember, but you, you cannot really use it, it was more, it was more a prototype not of the user interface, it was more a prototype of the, of the object per se. There is another thing, factor that is probably more important than the chip on the um, easiest to, to, to redo it, to change. 
They can compare the older version, yes, clearly, because they can have, they can try different alternatives, so this is easier, I will cut it, I change it easier, so yes, they can compare, or no, this is a bad choice, I will go back to the previous version. And there's another factor. Yes, you can, well, well, in this case, you can show a lot, but in this case, it was just one piece. So yes, you can show it, but. It takes one day to produce this, or less. To produce this, ready to the market, it's an investment. It can take years to generate something in this form factor, not nowadays, but back in the days. In that form factor, with that size, with that weight, ready to the public to sell it, this would take months, years to, done, to be done. This will take hours. And if you make this heavier than needed, or bigger than needed, you get one year of work and throw it away. And you start another year of work. If it's wrong again, you throw it again. If this is wrong, you cut it, easier to change. You cut it, smaller, you pick another piece of wood, and in one hour, in two hours, you edit the new version. Hmm? Clearly, so that are the, the essential piece. So this is for the hardware part, but a similar concept is for the software part, hmm? clearly. These are cheaper, faster to do and to change than not this. So clearly, this is the first prototype. Before doing that, they also had the medium fidelity prototype, like there in this link, there is a picture, I think, um, like, be, like big as this table with all the cables running between the screen and the, the computer that actually do the logic. But this is, they were probably one of the first to do that and extremize it a bit with this piece of wood. But actually, if you, if you look on, for instance, on the internet, you, find, you can find that uh, there exists not something like this, but a medium fidelity prototype for the iPhone, for the first iPhone. The first iPhone was a computer with a separate screen, and all the logic were on the computer. So it's not really portable. It's not really a phone, because you have to, to be sit down to, to, to a desk to use it. But still, it allow engineer to try all the software and to have more power than the actual device could have before manufacturing it. And also trying different size of the screen because all the logic was in a big computer on the side. So it's very common in industry, especially those that do, that do uh, hardware stuff, to create prototypes in the middle because it, they are cheaper, easier to change, to do, to refine. And also in the software industry, it is becoming more and more um, frequent to do that. Clearly, we, we cannot see a lot of example of this from the software point of view, because they are not concrete, but there are. Okay, so again, a prototype, it's a partial representation. Clearly, on that thing, on the palm, on the wood palm pilot, you cannot learn about the user interface. You cannot learn about how hard you have to press with the pen because it was wood and the pen was wood. So totally different material than the actual device, but something you can learn. So prototype will allow you to learn something in every stage. They had learned about the, the pen when they did the medium fidelity prototype or one of the medium fidelity prototype where they had the possibility to use a plastic pen on the touch screen that they had. So they could also change, but it's another step of the chain. And so prototypes start, let's say, from, well, it's widely used in the, the hardware industry, but those that make products. But still, in general, one, again, of the most powerful tool for exploration, visualization, and testing, because it's cheaper, it's easy, it's easy to change, you, it's not working, you throw it away, and you build it again. In one hour, you're run, up and running. Now, do that with a React application in one hour. Throw it away, start again. 
up to com feature complete for even one single task. It's not one hour. It's probably three days, etc. And they, in general, will allow us to see and feel the various interactivity steps. So we, we, we can have different stages of prototyping. And all of them clearly has various factor. One is time, one is the fidelity. So here there is also storyboard. Storyboard are the quicker to do, six sketches, and drawn without colors. Even if you are not an artist in drawing, you can do it a sketch some way that is at least communicate something and also has a terrible fidelity, a terrible realism because it's it's like a comic book. It doesn't tell you how you use the, the software, the user interface. Then moving, you have the low fidelity prototypes that again will start in assignment three that are a little bit more time expensive and will increase a little bit the fidelity because you have, it's a prototype. You have the screens, you can click on things, you can tap on things and something will happen in some way. Then you have a family, we will see one example, but it's a family of medium fidelity prototype, more time to do that, more fidelity. The high fidelity prototype, more time to do that, double in this representation the time of a low fidelity prototype, and but more fidelity. It's, it's called high fidelity for, for a reason. And then you have the final product. That is one step farther in fidelity and realism because it's the final product, the things that you're going to, to sell, to ship, to, to, to give for free, to allow people to use in their life, but also the, the most time consuming thing to do because there cannot be bugs. Everything should work, everything should be secure. Everything should be good enough for releasing it to people whatever they are. Hmm? In the prototypes, you have a control. You still have a control, even the high fidelity prototypes. If you have a high fidelity prototypes and ask people to test it, you can say, well, please do this, do this task for me. And actually, the task that you're going to do these people are the one that you added in the high fidelity prototype. So you have control. They cannot do something that is not implemented because you, you ask them to do specific tasks and not others. Uh, instead, in a final product, who knows? They will open it and tap it somewhere and everything should work. Everything should be present again, also with security and all maintainability, bug fixing, also you have all the process for that part. That with prototypes you don't have. Hmm? So different level of prototypes allow us to have conversation and to learn about something specifically. So the storyboard, we already said that, is all about the user task. So it will allow us to think and to speak and to represent the task of the user, hmm? to have a check on the task. The low fidelity prototype will allow us to understand the interaction between the pages, between the elements, etc. And we will learn about the user interaction with the low fidelity prototype but not about visual design. That is not something you can learn with a low fidelity prototype. It's something you can start learning with a medium fidelity prototype. So different level of prototypes will tell you different part of the story. The high fidelity prototype will allow you to focus on the details of the usability, on the colors, on all this perception that up to this point are missing and are missing on purpose so that you can focus on other aspects. Because if you put colors here, the first thing that people will notice and comment is colors. I don't like the green. I think that this contrast is not enough. I don't see the text. And you are not focusing anymore on user interaction. You are focusing on changing colors. That is something that you have to do, but it's something that you can do here after everything else is working. Everything else is move. All the flow between pages and between action is done, and is done in a proper way. 
And again, it will allow each of these steps to quickly test on user, feedback, iterate. So you can have, like in the Palm case, you can have one low fidelity prototype. You learn something, you redo another low fidelity prototype if you want before moving to the next step. So when it's enough, knowing about user interaction, you can move on the next step. And when it's enough about visual design, you can move to the next steps. Or you can do one iteration and move after. It depends of the time that you have, the commitment that you can put, et cetera, et cetera and the information you can get. Hmm? Yeah, we, we in this course would just have one iteration for each, not multiple iteration, okay? But the idea is that you iterate, always iterate on each step. And always iterate on prototype, testing, changing something in the design, prototype, testing, et cetera, et cetera. So just to conclude, what is a low fidelity prototype? And what is a high fidelity prototype in a visual way? So this is a low fidelity prototype, actually taken from this course last year. This was one of the projects of last year. And the course was slightly different from this year, but still, uh, this was a paper prototype, something that you can create. Uh, this is a low fidelity prototype made in paper, uh, and drawn. Mm -hmm. um, it was about exam, handling mm -hmm. students' exams. Uh, so here you see there are a lot of details that are missing, a lot. Not even the description is there. You know that this is a task with a title and a description, and then there is some button here, and the button had, and then another task, and then previous and next. You understand how to use it? You are missing all the details. But you have the main information, the main interaction, and the main design choices that you have. They decided to have these two cards here with an add button here, a previous and next, and all this option here. Good idea, bad idea. They could have the, they add the motivation to do that, and they tested it to discover if this is a good idea or not. Hmm? On the other side, you have the high fidelity prototype. This is the same page, mostly the same page of the same project of last year as a high fidelity prototype. Still has the task. It doesn't have, still have two, two cards, one here and one there, but now you have also the date that you didn't have before. And you don't have anything in the, in the back. Tasks are here, you can expand it, you have colors, you can select the select, you can add it one by pressing plus. You have all the details. If you expand it, you see what is in chapter one. You see that chapter one is for web application one. I don't know what is chapter one in web application one, but anyway. Uh, so you know that you have to write documentation. You have a task to write documentation. This is for, for students, hmm? something that the student can manage for better organizing the time for studying and passing exams, essentially. This was the idea of the application. Hmm? So it looks like the final product. It didn't do anything. It didn't do all. These ways weren't connected with the polytechnic exams. It had inside the three exams, always the same three. And with a predefined set of tasks and the possibility for you for adding another one or others. It was not feature complete. It doesn't have login. They don't need login to test the prototype. If you're not innovating in the login form, it's not something that you have to waste time doing the login. You assume that you are logged in already, hmm? as they did. That was one student of computer engineer that had to prepare web application one in that moment of time, according to the screenshot. But you have all the details from this that here you don't have. Hmm? So here there is the stark difference. This is a low fidelity prototype, a paper prototype in this case, and this is a high fidelity prototype of the same thing with changes in the design, because they learned something about the low fidelity prototype, they changed it, they did the medium fidelity prototype, 
and then they did the high fidelity prototype and they changed it again, and this is probably the version of the exam, so they also evaluated that uh, differently, again. So, again, this looks like the final product, but still a prototype. In which you have the colors, etc. And here, if, I, if you have to, to think about it, so this was, sorry, a high fidelity prototype made in code. So like this is a low fidelity prototype made on paper. Made on paper, this is a high fidelity prototype made in code. That is not the only way to do high fidelity prototype, like it's not the only way to do low fidelity prototype in paper. It's just one of the way. In the family of a low fidelity prototype, paper prototype is particularly cheap, easy, and fast. And in the family of high fidelity prototype, code prototyping is one thing that you have, if you are in engineering degree, you can do it easily more than using other tools for high fidelity prototype. And then the medium for the prototype is something in the middle, clearly. And, and we are going to, to see that in this tomorrow. We're going to see that tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll start here about some characteristic of the prototypes, then we will see better what is a paper prototype, how to build it, what is a medium fidelity prototype, and what is a high fidelity prototype, okay? And for today is enough, have a good, afternoon and evening.